Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miraz Rama. I will be speaking about argumentation structure and uh, engagement within this video. Uh, this is a part of the BDC Digital Academy. I think it's a great initiative by BDC to, to essentially use our time efficiently during this um, pandemic. Um, I hope everyone finds this video useful and uh, if you may, if you have any questions, feel free to knock me on Facebook or WhatsApp for further clarifications. Um, so um, how am I going to essentially structure this video? Um, first, I'll be talking about what are my initial thoughts when I uh, think of an argument and um, how do I essentially try to generate arguments? I think they'll be intertwined to some extent. Second of all, um, how do I decide if I want to keep an argument or if I don't want to keep them? Thirdly, how do I mechanize? Because I think most of my time, most of my material is consumed um, by the um, mechanisms trying to prove why certain things are true and how they pan out. Uh, obviously, fourth is the importance bit of an argument because I think I think this is something that a lot of new debaters may struggle with um, is that they may prove why certain things are true but they may not prove why certain things are important because I think like most edge goers they will you know come up with motions that are fairly balanced so both the sides they will you know have few arguments that are just true and there isn't really a factual rebuttal to it there isn't really a rebuttal that can prove why they're wrong so in a lot of cases you just have to prove why their anal analysis is less important than yours. Uh, the engagement bit, um, it's it's something that may not work in all debates, and um, some of the suggestions they seem like you know they seem a little. It's easy to come up with these suggestions, but to like um, implement them is a totally different ball game. So. There might be some difficulty in terms of applying them in all sorts of, um, you know, all in all sorts of debates. Obviously, these are things that um, I um, I found particularly useful um, as a whip uh, when I was whipping. So obviously, this isn't a whipping tutorial, but you know, uh, a lot of the engagement uh, and engagement tactics that I have um, they are a result of having a really good, you know, member speaker because my teammate was really good at what he did. So I had to, you know, sort of think from different angles. Uh, my engagement approach always needed to be uh, much more moderate than my first speaker's approach because obviously I got more time as well to come up with uh, engagement that um, could really undermine the opposition sides. Um, but before all of this, I, I think all, all the individuals doing this uh, video series would tell you that their suggestions aren't the only way of, um, you know, going about with a debate. So obviously, um, as a debater, you have to find out what you're comfortable with, what you find uh, works for you. So obviously, a lot of things I may say, you may disagree with them. A lot of things I, um, Adi and I used in our prep time, essentially a lot of other teams disagreed with and uh, they felt like it wasn't helpful for them. Uh, but mostly, you know, um, the reason why they were helpful for me because is because I had to work around my uh, work my way around my limitations. I had to I, I understood what are the things that I'm not particularly great at. So what are the things I need to um, come up with? What are the things that uh, people had taught me that I will use? And what are the things I will reject? Um, so obviously it, it depends on whether or not you are comfortable with them. So obviously use as many debates as you can to experiment with new tactics, new strategies, uh, and hopefully you will um, come up with your own way of approaching or analyzing or structuring arguments. Uh, so to begin with this series, uh, to, to begin with this video, the first thing that I can tell you is uh, what usually I do when I see a motion and have done that initial bit of um, you know just speaking with your partner about 
certain clarifications that you may have, certain things um, you may want to clarify, certain things your partner may want to clarify. Once you have essentially done that and have um, a more clear understanding of the debate, the first thing that I want to, the first thing that I want to do is usually try to come up with things that I want to prove, right? Um, this is a little counterintuitive that you have to know what you want to prove. You have to know the conclusion of your argument before you have even started analyzing your argument because, um, you know, a lot of people may tell you that you should naturally, um, arrive at conclusions after you have had your material after you've analyzed them so you know when you get a motion just um, a lot of people may tell you that just find a few arguments and then try to come up with a conclusion obviously they're right but I feel like for me what works is if I know the conclusion of my argument beforehand if I tell my partner that look this is what I want to prove so these are the two things these are the three things that I want to prove um, then it's much easier for me. So obviously, this is a difficult process. You have to, um, you know, have a few debates to essentially know what are the things that you would want to prove from a certain motion. Uh, once you know what you want to prove, it's just very easy to then structure the argument, right? Because um, the few advantages of doing so is would probably be if you have particular problems with uh, coming up with relevant matter, I think you just throw that problem out of the window, right? Because if you know what you want to prove, and then all your arguments, like two or three arguments that you may have, or two or three, say, reasonings or supporting arguments that you may have to prove that, um, you know, prove that clash or prove that statement that you essentially want to establish within the debate, you just have an internal check right you're only generating matter that proves an initial statement that you decided you want to prove right so it's just a thing that happens because you know you know what is your end goal right so you're not just coming up with random pieces of material you don't want your arguments to be all over the place you don't want your analysis to be all over the place so if you know that this is the conclusion uh, that I want to reach with my first argument it's just significantly easier for you to then come up with relevant matter, right? Um, now, how do you choose what you want to prove within a motion, right? And I think this is something obviously this is not um, you know, it will not happen naturally, it will not happen in instantaneously, it will require some time but what I can tell you is that once you look at a motion and you see few burdens, uh, burdens that you want to prove, I think it's just, you have to ask yourself two to three questions. Um, these are the questions that I ask myself. Um, so the first is, is this something I would want, I, I would win? Is this something that I can realistically prove? Uh, if I see that this is the conclusion that I want to um, reach it's something that I can essentially win the oppositions they may not have a response to it or it's not uh, they might not have a strong response to it obviously they'll have some responses uh, if I see that I'm going to win this clash for sure if I if I see that this is a conclusion that I can definitely win then obviously I'm going to approach it the second thing that I'm going to ask myself is if I cannot win it is it still relevant to the debate right because it, you have to think from the perspective of the edge core you have to think from the uh think from their perspective as to why we gave the motion and what does the motion demand from you if there is a particularly difficult um you know there's a particularly difficult burden or difficult difficult conclusion that you have to reach because the motion requires you to do so uh, you may come up with some mitigations because it's difficult to conclusively win that ground within the debate. But even if it's difficult, you cannot. You feel like it's 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 
it's going to take up a lot of time within your prep time to reach that conclusion but you still feel like the motion requires you to argue in that particular direction then you should but then there are times where you just feel like you know some directions you know they're not gonna they're not important to the debate they're not relevant but you can prove it nonetheless right uh, obviously don't approach uh, don't go in that direction obviously it's uh, a very basic suggestion right um, so let's give you an example so I think um, this was a motion we did in ABP 2018 uh, it was in Hanoi ABP uh, we were closing opposition so the motion was uh, this house believes that doctors that have um, conducted or supervised on um, interrogation will not be allowed in the civil sphere to practice medicine. I'll just give you the exact wording. Just uh, This house believes that military doctors that have conducted or supervised on methods aimed to extort information from prisoners should be barred by medical associations from practicing medicine in the civil sphere, all right? Now, once we looked at the motion, uh, we were we were CEOs, so there were stuff that uh, we had to come up with that was sort of new, uh, that could work as an extension. Um, the first thing that uh, we, that I personally asked myself is, can I somehow prove that it will make interrogation uh, techniques even worse? So that is the first thing that I asked myself. I told my partner that, look, this is what I want to prove. Uh, so obviously, as I mentioned earlier, that you have to, uh, you know, do the re uh, relevance check. Like, okay, it's easy to prove, but it's the important to debate. So. We ask ourselves, is it a comparative that we can win? Um, obviously, it's a comparative you can win because if it makes interrogation techniques worse, then obviously that's um, on a comparative worse than status quo where interrogation techniques happen, but uh, obviously them happening in a more inhuman manner is probably much, much worse. So obviously we had, uh, we realized that this is uh, a, uh, conclusion that we can reach and this is a comparative that we can win as well second thing that we asked ourselves was you know is it really uh, does the motion require us to argue this right so is it completely relevant or is it somewhat relevant to the debate um, uh, you know the level of relevance there's something that we can work with so obviously we realize that sure this is a conclusion that we can win this is um, a comparative that we can win, then we should uh, approach them. So first, we knew the conclusion. Second of all, we asked ourselves, is this something that we can realistically prove? Is the opposition going to have like unfair advantage uh, in that particular direction of the debate? So we realized that, no, it favors us, so why not go ahead with it? Once we knew the direction, once we knew the conclusion, it was just easier for us to then come up with arguments because all we had to prove was why will it make interrogation worse, right? And we came up with a bunch of reasoning like um, if you don't allow doctors to practice medicine in the in civil sphere, then the doctors that get into the military are going to be like hardline nationalists um, who probably care a lot about their country to the extent where uh, they're okay losing their they're okay with losing their medical license once they're back from the army so also we talked about how this might just you know increase the tenure of military doctor who are you know willing to do these um, terrible acts so obviously we all the matter that we generated from that point onwards um, obviously until we came up with a new direction um, for for a considerable amount of time, all the matter that we generated was solely aimed towards proving why, you know, interrogation is going to be worse as a result of passing this motion. So, it's very easy in that way to remain relevant within a motion. Uh, now, 
the thing is, most of this reasoning that you may have, and most of the arguments that you may have in order to prove uh, that particular line of thought, most of the time, most of it is going to be just, you know, part of mechanizing the argument, right? So you just come up with different sort of mechanisms to prove as to why your um, conclusion that you will eventually reach uh, is going to pan out in the way you think it will. So most debates uh, nowadays, they probably have the same conclusion in a lot of cases as well. Um, or most of the time you argue a lot about the mechanics, uh, mechanisms of the arguments, right? So you have to prove why your argument is true, how the world works, um, how, do the, uh, how do the actors that you uh, are talking about, what do they act in the way you describe them. Um, so in a lot of cases, the mechanisms of your arguments, they will consume a lot of time. Uh, so the third thing that I do when I see an argument, when I want to construct an argument, after knowing what I want to prove, after doing the relevance check, is ask myself, how am I going to mechanize this, right? And often cases, that is the bit where I come up with most, um, most number, or like most amount of matter, right? Because I can just, you know, use my analysis of hardline nationalist doctors as a way of mechanizing this argument. Uh, so obviously, if, when you're trying to mechanize an argument, always try to make sure that there are two things that you are uh, taking care of, right? Obviously, always think of the incentive structure of uh, the particular actors that you're talking about, all right? So what is the incentive of an actor to behave in the way that you describe them to uh, act? And obviously, uh, the second thing that you can do in mechanizing arguments is show a trend analysis like, um, you know, a particular actor or particular institution, they have acted in a particular way. Uh, so you can assume that they would act that way in the future, right? So obviously it's not as simple as that. You have to give some level of uh, examples. You have to give some level of analysis to why uh, people who have acted in a particular way will keep on acting in that way in the future as well. Um, let's take... Another example, um, this was a motion in UADC 2018. This is, um, this house regrets the popular portrayal of individuals with mental disorders as creative geniuses. Um, again, we were opposition in this debate. So, once we got this motion, um, we did the same thing. We asked ourselves, okay, what is it we want to prove? Uh, so since it's a regrets motion, we just want to prove that why the portrayal of uh, these particular individuals have led to uh, them being taken care of within our society in a much better manner, right? So that is something that we wanted to prove, that look, this portrayal has um, act actually helped these individuals, right? Um, now once we establish that, um, that portraying them as creative geniuses has been beneficial or I think it's a very broad statement to use so if I were to uh, word it correctly um, for example why has it allowed society to uh, treat them equally I think that is um, a much more concise conclusion and it's more precise as to what we want to achieve out of it with that motion um, so any sort of material then we come up with trying to prove why this portrayal essentially um, you know led to them being treated fairly um, we don't have the risk of sounding irrelevant within the debate so um, what are the ways through which you can then mechanize it right um, I think you can mechanize it by saying that, look, if you portray certain indi individuals as creative geniuses, uh, you just change the incentive mechanisms of politicians to, you know, like, cater to them more. So, like, in terms of uh, funding for special needs schools, uh, for, um, you know, acceptance within schools by teachers like 
uh, in terms of getting them admission in the schools. I think these are the things that change because uh, you feel like there are individuals who have, um, you know, an ability to function, uh, function efficiently or function perhaps even better than other individuals and provide some sort of return, right? So politicians have an incentive to get some sort of return from the funding that they assign to particular schools, particular educational institutions. So if you can prove that, you know, it just, it just plays into the incentives of these politicians, then you can mechanize it better, right? So the first three things, they, I, I put them in that particular order you don't have to do so. So telling the judges what I want to prove, uh, then obviously not going to tell the judges if you're going to particularly win that conclusion or not. Obviously, this is something that is an internal check. Uh, the third thing is obviously mechanizing that argument, right? So laying out the incentives of the actors um, while you discuss um, the mechanisms part is going to be very helpful, right? So you lay out, like, these are the incentives of politicians, these are the incentives of teachers. Um, politicians want more return from the funding that they put into education institution. Teachers want to give admission to students who will, I don't know, get good grades and whatnot. Uh, once you set up the incentives and then you discuss how your, um, you know, how the motion plays into the incentive structures of these individuals, you are probably going to mechanize the argument better. All right, so now that you have uh, gotten a basic understanding of how to essentially A, come up with the argument and then present it, um, so what is the fourth thing that you need to do? Um, the fourth thing that I always do within my um, speeches, or at least um, any, like, I may break that order sometimes, but in most cases, uh, it really, in almost all the cases, this is the order that I follow, right? So tell the judges what I want to prove, uh, mechanisms, and um, within that mechanisms part, I lay out the uh, incentives first, uh, tell why, tell the judges why it, you know, uh, plays into the uh, incentive structure of these actors. And then I have, like, some level of relevant material like I can say that I have provided some level of relevant material to prove my initial hypothesis right um, what is the last bit that I do um, this is um, I have to tell the judges why my argument is important within the debate right uh, so remember that part where you know you asked yourself is this something that you can realistically prove Right, so this was just an internal check, right? But I think this can also be important in terms of you having an idea as to why certain arguments are important, right? Um, so first, if you see that a particular direction or a particular conclusion, um, it's difficult to prove, but you know that your opponents are going to harp on it, right? Uh, you have to ask yourself a few things, right? Um, and I think this is very, very basic, right? First, it has to be, is it about a particularly extremely vulnerable actor within this motion, right? So if you see that it is about a particularly vulnerable actor, you have to at least have some contribution in that clash or in that, um, you know, direction of the debate. Um, or if it includes a vast majority of people, if it includes, like, say, uh, a sizable number of individuals who are going to suffer or who are going to be benefited, that obviously, even if it's difficult for you to win an argument, uh, win an argument that heads, to a, heads towards that direction, you still have to attempt to mitigate the harms or mitigate the benefits provided by your opponents, right? But the same principle applies to the arguments that you think you'll be able to prove, right? So, after you essentially conclude the argument, you have to tell the judges why your arguments are important, right? Uh, there are several ways of doing so, as I've said, like the, vulner the extent of vulnerability or the number of individuals affected. Obviously, you can um, you know, exp tell the judges as to why um, your arguments are most important in that regard. Or 
what you can do is essentially just have a competitive that you th- like you just definitely win right so the motion about the doctors um, not being able to practice I think like the competitive that you have is it's just you're definitely going to win this if you prove like you know interrogation is going to be worse than what it is in status quo you're just going to win right but if it's something if it's a close clash like the other team comes up and says um, if we would we are okay with interrogate interrogation getting worse but probably they have some other benefits uh, probably they concede that yeah it's going to get worse then you just have to tell the judges as to the extent of harm and the extent of vulnerability of the individuals that are going to be harmed as a result of uh, you know passing this motion or not passing this motion depending on which side you're on right so to give a recap obviously try to come up with a conclusion first if you can do so uh, it has been helpful for me because it helped me remain relevant um, second of all obviously you don't put this into an argument you just do this as an internal check you ask yourself to what extent you can win this um, can you are you definitely going to lose this um, if you lose this what amount of time are you going to spend on this because the motion in a in, in a lot of cases might require you to argue uh, in that direction regardless of how easy or difficult it is for you to win it uh, the next thing is obviously you try to mechanize it within that mechanization part you have like laying out the mechanisms and then proving why it plays down to their incentives um, there's also trend analysis that you can do in order to prove certain mechanisms to be true uh, obviously this, this can get a little factual like it has happened in the past it can happen in the future as well uh, you have to show why um, this trend analysis um, it's it's going to survive different contexts different circumstances you have to prove them um, then lastly the importance bit where you essentially weigh in uh, the argument so this is a basic structure there's not much to it but I feel like uh, doing it in the counter intuitive manner for me where I uh, lay out the conclusion first is easier for me um, the second bit in this video is going to be about engagement right um, now what what I have noticed uh, in my university debating is that in terms of engagement uh, if you credit your opponents to some extent I think it's just easier for the judge to then you know get a realistic picture of the debate so obviously there's a lot of basic uh, engagement tutorials I can give you a brief um, such as you know why you should uh, attack the strongest arguments and not harp on the weakest ones um, what, uh, things such as always trying to attack the reasoning and not the assertion and whatnot these are very basic um, but in most cases it's just you know hard to follow the structures uh, because you know sometimes there is a team might have like really strong piece of evidence and you need to rebut it I'm obviously like I'm sure most very basic debating handbooks would tell you that don't go after the evidence and whatnot but sometimes it just re it requires you to you know engage with the evidence and prove why that evidence is irrelevant and whatnot um, so these are the things that I personally find is useful for me when I try to engage with an argument um, so the first thing that I try to do is I don't disregard an opponent's argument entirely because I feel like you know I try to look at the merit of the argument like there has to be some bit of that argument that is true so it's not probably in the exaggerated manner it's probably not in the grand manner that my opponents tell me that they are so I try to be an adjudicator and think okay if this is a benefit or if this is a harm that my opponents have uh, you know argued what part of it is actually true what part of it is actually valuable and then um, I try to essentially you know just tell the judges that the benefits that the teams have presented 
are not as grand as they as the teams claim them to be now what this does is you know while you're agreeing that the other team can be right it just puts in a lot of doubt in the judge's mind because first they hear an argument and then think oh it has a lot of benefits it has a lot of harms and they just come up and tell the other team that yeah they are right but to this extent only i think what this does is it it instills a lot of confusion in the judge's mind and it's uh it's beneficial in the sense then is that then you can just embellish your own harms or your own benefits uh, by saying that, look, uh, on a scale, uh, our benefits are much more grand, our harms are much more severe than the other side. I think once you do that, it's just easier for the judge to A, uh, be really confused because they feel like, uh, yeah, sure, that team is correct, but their benefits aren't as nice as I thought uh, they are. Um, the reason why you should do so because it adds a little bit of moderation within debates because uh, to come up and tell the judges that something that your opponents promised will happen it's never going to happen whatsoever is a huge burden to take so for example let's take um uh, let's take the motion of uh, UP final uh, 2019 I think it was the motion was something along the lines of supporting uh, pursuing self-interest as a dominant moral guide so again we were closing opposition um, so within that debate what happened was uh, we could identify that CG had a really good case right CG had told us that look if pursuing self-interest was a dominant moral guide then um, you would just have, have a society that functions better, right? Because, you know, you would be okay with workers asking more wages, asking more rights, and you would think that that's, yeah, that's moral, that's moral, that's morally the right thing to do because they're pursuing the self-interest, right? Um, and individuals would then essentially deliver those rights to other, indi uh, to individuals who are, like, Corporations would then just deliver those rights to uh, labors because they're just pursuing their self-interest, which is accepted, right? Uh, now, obviously, this was an argument that was worded significantly better. Um, and I think the first bit of response from my member of opposition was that it's not going to happen. Um, this is not a benefit that will actually pan out in real world, right? Uh, now the thing is, it is extremely difficult to take that burden and say that they're entirely wrong, rather than to just come up and say that, look, some part of their argument is true and some part of it is just not true and uh, it's just a very marginal benefit, it's just a very small benefit uh, versus the, you know, benefits that you provide that affect more people or that have meaningful, that can create meaningful changes. So, what we did, like, how I engaged with that argument was that I told the judges that yes, there'll be some level of acceptance of people pursuing their rights, uh, but it will come at the cost of you also pursuing your self-interest, right? So what this essentially means is that you might be altruistic to some extent, but that altruism will always come with an asterisk, right? It's always going to come up with a condition. Like, if you're going to help someone, you're going to um, ask yourself as to how it benefits you, alright? Because if you're always trying to pursue your self-interest, then if you want to help a particular say group that is disenfranchised you're not going to help them with their civil rights um, you're not going to help them with their right to free speech you may help them in terms of economic emancipation but also on your terms also on um, you know 
by doing things that you feel are good for them because it somehow benefits you as well, right? So you'll give them a, a job in a particular industry that is beneficial to your own country or too beneficial to you. But the meaningful changes that happen as a result of self-interest not being the moral uh, dominant guide, where your empathy is generated, where your morality is um, constructed on um, you know, metrics that don't revolve around self-interest. So what this essentially did was you could prove that there will be some level of economic emancipation, but other like other benefits that opposite like the other teams claim um, in terms of you being okay with whatever rights other individuals demand for themselves is not going to be true. So their benefit is probably marginal, right? So you could prove that look, it's a very small benefit. And then it's, it's just easier for you to prove why your benefits or your harms on a competitive are much bigger and they cause meaningful change, right? So the, the first thing, so this is the first bit that I can um, suggest you to incorporate in your engagement uh, aspect of debates, right? So try to give some credits to opposition, to your opponents. Try to give them, um, try to ask ourselves to what bit is actually true, what benefits will accrue in their world, and then try to minimize those benefits. Try to, don't just come up and say, these benefits won't accrue at all. Just try to come up and say that, look, these benefits are probably going to um, happen in this manner, in a much more minimized manner. So in a way, you're actually... Um, mechanizing their argument you're actually telling the judges as to how like what is a realistic depiction of their world uh why is this important again like i think we have a tendency of doing the best case worst case thing very prematurely in a lot of debates so you know if you go into this uh if you want to engage to this argument by showing okay their best case is workers getting rights but uh, our worst case is still better than that I think what this does is it robs the debate it robs the judges of a realistic depiction of the world um, and in a lot of cases you just sound smarter in a debate if you just come up and say that the debate happens on a much more moderate ground the framing of the debate uh, can be done in a much more moderate manner by just minimizing the arguments from the other side I think it's uh, significantly better if you take that approach. Um, the next thing that I'll discuss, it sort of intertwines with what I said in my argumentation structure a bit. So in a lot of cases, um, once you try to engage with the other team, you just have to say why your argument is more important than the arguments that the other side may have. Uh, because you will see that in many cases there's just not a strong rebuttal to their argument. So you can't really prove as to why they're wrong. In such a scenario, you just have to explain why your argument is more important, right? Uh, again, uh, I already explained it in my argument structure a bit as to how you do so by either saying um, it doesn't affect a large number of people or, you know, the extent of benefit or the severity of vulnerability created as a result of it um, is significantly less in your opponent's argument. I think you can always um, try to explain the importance of your argument and just make the trade-off, like, just come up and tell the judges, okay, we are willing to concede this arm because it just allows us to um, get this benefit. Uh, I think this is something I did throughout UADC 2019 and I felt that our, our team really benefited as a result of us having that approach, right? Um, just taking the strongest argument of um, our opponents and just telling the judges that we are okay with a particular harm such as um, the harm that our opponents pointed out happening because we may have some other benefits. So obviously your benefits, obviously they need to be more important and 
they need to fit into into the criteria that i mentioned right so obviously engagement there there's a lot of you know basic um uh, elements to it um uh, what i discussed these are just personally things that i try to do within debates i'm when i try to engage i don't really um try to go for the best case worst case immediately i try to portray a realistic depiction of the other side i try to you know not reject an argument in totality i try to um give my opponent certain benefit by telling them that okay this argument is true but only to this extent and then it's just easier for me to prove as to why my arguments are more important um yeah so this is more over um it if you guys have any question please feel free to comment on the if it's uploaded on youtube please feel free to comment uh if you have access to my facebook profile just send me a message i'll 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 respond as quickly as i can um i hope you guys find this helpful thank you very much